All right, let's go over the agenda first. Um, so the agenda I've got for today, and I apologize for uh, this coming on right, right, right before, but hopefully we're going to just kind of jam through this. Um, had a, uh, oh, a typical sort of, um, um, you know how Microsoft's always changing things every time they put out new windows? Well, you know, I keep running into those things all the time. So ran into one of those on a demo I want to do today. May or may not be able to do it. Um, but in any case, uh, we're here. Um, so here's the agenda today for Friday, week four. Um, um, we're going to cover some uh, lean metrics, like we said uh, last time. Hopefully you've had a chance to read over. And particularly the time metrics um, are what we're going to cover today. So um, those, are, um, <clears throat> those are tact time, uh, lead, cycle, and then also something called exit rate. And we're going to tie some of these together with something called Little's Law. And I'll show how that works in um, one of the exercise, um, exercises for the assignment, uh, which is probably in some ways the most difficult to conceptualize. But it's also, I think, the thing that really shows the value of, of looking at these things together. Um, I'm going to very, very briefly, very, very briefly talk about uh, what are called lean solutions. Now, lean, um, we talked about this uh, last time. I think John asked the question, you know, what's really the difference? Maybe it wasn't John, maybe it was somebody else. But what's really the difference between uh, uh, Six Sigma and Lean? And at a high level, uh, you know, Lean is about flow and eliminating waste. Six Sigma is about eliminating errors and making the stuff that we do that we need to be good at better. Uh, Lean is about removing all the stuff that we don't need to do at all um, and really speeding that stuff up. So these are solutions that are geared toward doing that, toward mostly reducing the de delays. That's what they're really for. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll also take a little bit of time uh, talking through the team tools. Um, and um, actually, that's going to be about a third of the lecture today. Um, particularly, I'm going to ask you to remember the phrase BAM, um, which is uh, which stands for, when we get to it, brainstorming, affinity, multivote. It's a three tools kind of put together, jammed together, um, that when you use them in conjunction, they're really effective. And uh, we'll try to do one of those uh, today live um, uh, between, between us and get some participation going. All right, well, it's also about that time <laughs> where we really um, bite the bullet and do what I, I think some people were, would call sort of real statistics. Up until now, we've been making plots and stuff like that. And all that, by the way, I'm a big believer in all that. I'm a big believer in understanding what you're doing by making a picture of it. Um, however, there are some calculations that we need to back up uh, what we see. And so uh, I want to give you the background on this. Now, the bad news <laughs> is uh, when you're first going through it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. There's a lot of simple parts to it. Um, however, if you try and step back a little bit, um, th there's a sameness to all of it. And that's the beauty, is that it's basically, once you master it, it's all the same, no matter what statistical test you're doing. They all work pretty much exactly the same. Um, and the mechanics are the same. And the conclusions of it, you'll, you'll learn essentially to be able to just do the test, look at the conclusions, and make them pretty quickly. Um, um, all right. And uh, then we will look at, um, because the in our assignment, there's, I think, one question on ANOVA. Uh, we'll look at the section on ANOVA and chi-square. Uh, it, it's really um, an extension of what we'll cover uh, before. And I'll show you what that extension is, and I'll tell you what it is. And then I'll tell you why nowadays you don't even need this stuff. Um, just so that you know, though, the language is out there. When people talk about ANOVA or something like that, just realize, oh, no, it's just a, an example of a hypothesis test. That's all it is. Um, and here's the setting for it. 
All right, in the very end of the day, and this is my sort of deferred demo, if we have some time, I want to talk about the central limit theorem, which is kind of like, this is really black belt material. Okay, this is one of the things that separates, I think, black belts from, uh, from green belts, is their understanding of what goes on in the background and why some of these things work. So this explains a little bit about why things work. Um, there's also a sampling and sample size discussion in there, um, but uh, we may or may not take some time to, to talk about that right now. Definitely we'll talk about sample size as we finish this, um, this material, but um, the sad part is where you want to know and when you, where you want to do uh, sample size and when you want to be thinking about sample size is when you're first collecting data, and that's probably already happened, and we gave you some rules of thumb. But now we're going to show you the statistical underpinning so you can make some calculations. Um, so um, that's that. Um, so that's where we're going today. Any questions on the uh, agenda or what questions do you have on the agenda? Okay. So I do want to, uh, I do want to re, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, just a, a little bit of a recap <laughs> over what we talked about last time, the main thing that I wanted to get was on baselining, right? And just to, just to punctuate this, up until now, we've mostly spent our time looking at our why, our outputs, right? Um, so when we talk about baselining, baselining, when we're talking about baselining our why, and we've gone to great pains to talk about this, there are two parts to it. What are those two parts? to baselining your why, your KOV, your why. What are those two parts? Let me see if I can draw a picture and help jog your memories. Are you asking for voice of process and voice of a customer? Great. Voice of process is one part and voice of customer is another part. How do we do the voice of process? What tool do we use and what do we look for? So stability and the capability. Excellent. So which one is stability and which one is capability? Voice of process or voice of customer? Which one is stability? Would be voice of process, right? Voice of process, we're assess yes, excellent. So we're we're, assess we're assessing the stability of a process when we look at the voice of process. Mm -hmm. And then we have this other thing, capability, that's associated with the voice of the customer. Okay, great. What tools do we use to assess the stability and the capability? We use a control chart uh, for the voice of the process. Excellent. So this is a control chart, right? This is a control chart. Uh, we'll put in the red lines. Excellent. And that helps us. And, uh, and Steve, what's on, the X, uh, what's on the X axis? We're measuring on a control chart. We're measuring time. the time. This is time, right? Exactly. Time. Right. So we're looking at our Y over time. Uh, that's on a control chart. And really, what are we looking for when we look at this? How do we assess the stability? Uh, we're looking for... Things that are kind of outliers, um, the, the process being within the controls, within the upper and lower limits. Good. Okay. Trends and mm -hmm. things like that. Excellent. So we are looking at trends, but primarily we're looking for outliers, right? And we call those special cause conditions, right? Okay, excellent. And the recommendation was if you see some outliers, try to get the process in control first. And then, uh, and then uh, work on the capability if you need to make it better. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, how about the capability? What tool or tools did we use to do the capability? First of all, I guess, what is capability? Anybody? Percent good versus percent bad. That's it. It's just percent good, right? So it, it, capability is, let's talk about this maybe uh, we'll move a little bit over here so we have a little bit more space. Capability is percent good. That's it. That's, that's what capability is. 
okay? Or if you're a glass half empty person, <laughs> like most statisticians, it's percent bad. And, and, and realize that those are basically, you're, you're looking at the same thing, right? Because if it's 75% good, that necessarily means it's 25% bad. Okay, um, so what tool or tools do we use to look at that? How do we how do we make a picture of what that capability is? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody other than histogram? Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Steve already said. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so we make a history. Not to say it. Yeah, that's okay. We make a histogram of it. Okay. Of whatever our y is. Now, notice the y is on the x-axis now. The y or our our output variables on the on the horizontal axis now, right? And then what we do is we put a, and I'm gonna color it differently. <clears throat> we essentially draw a line in this at a certain point, and we'll talk about what that point is. And if we're looking at percent good, let's say, y, uh, let's say our Y is cycle time. Uh, cycle times usually long cycle times are bad, short cycle times are good. So this might be our percent good where I'm coloring in the blue. Okay, that might be that might be our capability. Okay, making some sense. All right, now um, somebody other than Steve or Tammy, um, tell me about the difference between the red and the blue lines. What's the difference? Are they the same? No, they're not the same. Uh, the red lines are um, your upper and uh, lower control limit, so your deviation. Excellent. So they come from so the origin. They come from the process. They come from the process, and they come from the data that's coming out of the process, right? Yes. Excellent. And then the blue line is that's that's your your customer. You got it. So the customer. Right, or your boss or whatever, but this is coming from Mount Olympus, we always used to say. It's coming down from Mount Olympus. Somebody is saying, we don't want this to be more than a two-day turnaround, right? Whether that's the customer or whether it's a proxy for the customer. There's some business call that <coughs> that's associated with this. And that's why it's important to do both of these, both of these two different things. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> now a couple couple more questions. So how does this differ from the average? How does capability differ from the average of a process? I mean, we often hear, oh, the capability. Well, its its current baseline is uh, eighteen point two five minutes on average. How is capability maybe? How is capability better than uh, saying the average? Or how is this combination of stability and capability better than just stating the average? Average is stating where you're at, and the capability is where you want to be. Um, not quite. Uh, the capability, um, the uh, but it but it's it's that's close. Um, so the average just says what you're at on average, right? It can be very misleading. It doesn't it doesn't tell you which customers or how much customers are suffering. Um, for just for as an example, how many of us have more than the average number of legs? My guess is that all six of us have more than the average number of legs. And in fact, it, it, in fact, over 99% of the population has the, the number of legs that we have is above average. The reason is because the average number of legs in the human population is uh, less than two. So that's, I mean, that's a, just an extreme example of how averages can mislead. Um, uh, another, <clears throat> an opposite example is, Almost all of us, I can guarantee, have the less than the average number of social connections, um, and that's because that the at the top end are some astronomical numbers um, that pull the average tremendously above, so that almost everybody is below average. Um, so averages can be very, very misleading, um, and uh, I think we did a couple of examples where you know it might look like the average of this process, and I'm just going to draw in the average here. I'm just guessing, okay? Suppose it were there, 
you might think, oh, we're good, we're fine, we're below average. On, on average, we're below that spec. And that can be very misleading because we're not taking into account, you know, what percent bad is there? If that's 25%, yeah, we're below average, <laughs> or, or our process is averaging below that spec, but there's still a lot of pro there's still a lot of customers who are suffering from this. So, just something to keep in mind. Customers feel the variation; they don't feel average of a process. They feel variation. Um, think about it this way: if this doesn't work, if that if that discussion didn't work for you, the pictures didn't work. Suppose that you went to a restaurant, your favorite restaurant or a, a restaurant that somebody recommended to you, and the first time you went there, you got that absolutely best meal that you've ever had in your life. The second time you had just about the average, just about the most perfect meal that you've ever had, almost, almost as perfect as the first time. And the third time you went there, you didn't, you, 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 your, your, your meal was not cooked right and there was a cockroach running around the plate. And you might say, well, would you go back to that? Well, on average, it's doing pretty well. You know, two fantastic meals and one meal that you, that you wouldn't want to eat at all, you probably wouldn't go back to that restaurant. You're feeling the variation that that restaurant's giving you, not the average. Um, and you probably wouldn't recommend that to a friend um, or go back. So if that did, you know, hopefully one of those two things helped. Okay. Um, uh, one more question that I wanted to ask about capability, just because it's it's so fundamental to what we're doing. All right, um, there were some questions. When we have a lot of data, when we have a lot of data, we can just <clears throat> draw the line. I'm going to just leave it as black now and count, right? And count. If that's percent bad, we're good. I mean, we're okay if we want to do that, right? If we have a lot of data. What do we do if we don't have that much data? If we have little data, how do we proceed to get a capability or to estimate, excuse me, estimate the problem, the capability? If it looks like it's a, a normal, um, I'm going to start doing my homework. I forgot the word. That, that's okay. Normal, right. We use some normal distributions, but Essentially, I think what, what you, you're trying to articulate is you take whatever that histogram looks like and you take your pen, at least in your mind you do, and you kind of draw a smooth curve, right? And then we look in our bag of tricks <laughs> and we had four distributions. One was normal, one was exponential, one was log normal, And the fourth one was called Weibull. And I never remember whether it has two L's or one. No matter how many times I look it up, I just can't do it. And remember, I said this is often used in reliability. So let's not worry about that one for now. You look in your bag of tricks, and you see which one is this closest to, and then you select that one. And then you go and you do this PDF, right? Which is really looking up a probability for, for this. Um, in the uh, in Excel, Excel Excel stats, this is a PDF. And remember, you need the mean and the standard deviation. So you need the mean and you need the sigma, and uh, you plop it in, and it will, and you put in this number, whatever this number is for the spec, and Excel stats kind of gives you that area smoothed under that curve. But keep in mind that this is approximate, so um, this is all approximate, so it's better than counting, but it's still approximating, and you're you're using a model, our bag of tricks, usually normal, exponential, or long normal. Okay? Generally speaking, hopefully most of us will have enough data so that we can count. Um, and you know what? Counting is not a bad practice anyway, so even if you're doing a fit, you should probably count uh, just to make sure it, it makes some sense. Okay. Uh, I want to remind you that the, there is a video on this uh, where we go into all of these uh, and do a number of different calculations. And these are just basically for, the, it, we find out that this is, in classical statistics, we don't call it capability, we just call it probability. That's just called probability. That's what it is. And uh, so 
that's what we're that's what we're doing in that. Okay, I wanted to make sure that we close the loop on that because that's something that if you're not getting it, please call me and we will go over some things and I'll have you try and do some exercises so we can we can get it. But um, this is one of the key things. You need to get that baselining is those two parts. It's the voice of process and voice of customer. Okay. And um, the, the voice of process is stability. We're using a control chart to examine that. And the voice of customer is capability. Capability is just a histogram with a line in it. We put that line at the spec. The customer tells us what that spec is. And we look at the percent good or the percent bad. And hopefully, um, we've given you some ammunition to articulate why it's better or certainly significantly different than just looking at the average of a process. Okay, I'm going to move on.org. Um, unless there are additional questions, um, let's move into the section on metrics. Um, uh, let's go into the section on metrics um, in our binders. Well, I should have had this up before. Okay. Okay, so um, the main thing I wanted to talk about in this one was to talk about uh, the tack time. And this is starting on page uh, 16. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, so um, this is starting on slide 16. Um, so let's take a look at um, essentially the tack time, um, the lead time, the cycle time, oops, and uh, throughput. And then we'll talk about something called Little's Law and see how they all kind of work together um, to do this. And I want to talk about that one homework uh, or uh, assignment question that is on um, uh, in this section. So let's, um, let's start by just talking about tack time. So, um, I mentioned before that this <laughs> this little picture, it means baton. It's kind of, some people call it in lean, people talk about the heartbeat of production. That's what this is supposed to be telling you. It's supposed to be telling you sort of what is the, what is the heartbeat that we need to be doing to produce what we need to for, for the customers. It's got a definition here, which I'm sure you can read over and you can figure it all out. And we'll go through a specific example, but Think about it at a high level like this. Suppose, um, um, well, for the for the for the folks folks in Amatech, the um, the optical tables uh, project. How many optical tables do you need to deliver in the next six months? Roughly, twenty or so. A hundred. Six months, probably higher than. 20. Maybe closer yeah. to a hundred. Okay. Yeah. Great. Let's say a hundred in the next six months, right? So if we if we divide that by the number of days, right? And I'm going to ballpark that uh, by um, oh gosh. Well, let's just uh, yeah. So if we if we ballpark that, what is that? About 180 days, <laughs> right? Something like that. Um, go ahead. You're counting weekends. I am counting weekends. Right. So okay. if, okay. if we, I don't know if you work on the weekends, but if we could subtract out those weekends, if we wanted to do it per work week, uh, I'm sorry, per weekday, um, let's say that we have uh, 150 workdays in that. I'm just guessing, right? Whatever that six months is, I don't know the exact number. It's probably a little bit less. But um, essentially, then we would take that 100 and divide by the number of, uh, by 150 days. That's how many optical tables we need to we need to complete per day, right? We need to complete two-thirds of an optical table per day. Our tack time, in this case, if we wanted to put it in per days, would be point would be two-thirds or 0.66. Does that make sense to folks? It's just when you think about what do we need to deliver, how much time do we have to deliver it, it's putting into a per time measurement. Okay? Make sense? Okay, um, hopefully that did. Uh, now let's go over the specific uh, thing. And if you're doing it in more detail, you probably want, like if you're doing uh, it for measuring the capacity of a service uh, group, you'll want to subtract out break time and, and other things like that. So um, 
let's take a look at this example. Suppose you're running a call center um, or doing um, a you're running a service center where you have 100 service calls per day, <clears throat> and we're going to assume um, that uh, it takes 45 minutes for breaks on an eight-hour shift. What's the tack time for this? Um, so here we're looking. Um, uh, this is a person, right? This is one person. If they're handling 100 service calls per day, and they're taking 45 minutes uh, for breaks in a half-hour shift, what is that? So um, we're taking the number of hours times 60. We're converting it into, uh, I guess, into minutes instead of days. 60 minutes in an hour, 100 units. That's four point every 4.3 minutes. I'm going to produce a unit. Now, <coughs> now this this is not to put uh, pressure on people. That's not the idea. The idea is to just get an idea so that later we can compare our lead time or our cycle time to this and understand if we're able to do what we need to do. All right. Hopefully this is pretty direct stuff. Okay, let's take a look at um, let's take a look at lead or cycle time. And um, uh, uh, by the way, these are all on average things, right? So I just got done talking about why averages can be misleading. These can be misleading too, but they can also be helpful. So um, um, in any event, this is an on average uh, on average thing. Certainly, some of these service calls are going to take more than four minutes. Some are going to take less. Okay, if we go forward a couple um, slides to slide uh, 21, um, let's take a look at lead time. So lead time is the average time it completes an activity. It, it takes to complete an activity from start to finish. So lead time includes all the delays, and that's important um, because again, the customer feels the lead time. If you make an order from Amazon. Um, you know, you place your order, you're looking at how long it takes to get to your door. You really don't care how long Amazon is taking to process it or uh, things like that. Um, you care about how long it's taking to get to you. Now, typically, people, um, now, by, by the way, cycle time has many different definitions, so just be wary of it. The definition that we're using in here is essentially the task time. And again, this is an average. So this would be, <clears throat> Um, not the time, like if we were talking about pizza, again, the pizzas, uh, when you're looking at it, is the time that it takes to, uh, between your order and when they delivered it. Um, and uh, you're seeing everything. You're seeing the, if they put the, if they put the box on a shelf and it waited for 10 minutes, you're seeing that delay. You're feeling it. Um, on the other hand, cycle time may not take that into account. It may not take those delays into account. So that's kind of work time versus, or touch time, some people call it. Okay, now finally, the, th the last thing I want to talk about is, is exit rate. Um, and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, also a work in progress. So uh, all these things kind of work together. Lead time, lead time is kind of the key thing that we're going to be able to, comp uh, that we're going to be able to um, compare and look at, like, if we're trying to um, reduce how long something takes from start to finish, that's what we're talking about, our, our lead time. It's related to a couple of different things. And this is uh, from Little's Law, actually. I'll show you, we'll do an example of this. Um, but um, uh, let's actually walk through uh, uh, this deli example. So if lead time is the beginning to end, a lot of times it's easier to fix things, not by trying to force work on lead time directly, but instead to work on things like um, how, how the exit rate or the throughput, which is the same, the same term, or the amount of work in progress. So let's take a look at this example. In lead time, this is the time from release of a product into its process until it's completed, uh, usually from the customer's perspective. Now, if you're standing in line at the deli to get lunch, the lead time is the time you enter the line until you take your first bite of the sandwich. That's the lead time. Work in process, or sometimes sometimes called WIP, is um, the product that's within the boundaries of the process. And so, in our deli example, it's all it's the number of people who are in line um, ahead of you, okay, and are being served. 
Now, there's lots of other things that we can talk about as being work in progress, right? Part of that, if we're talking about the, the building of the sandwich, we're talking about meats and things like that. Um, but let's just keep it simple and say it's the number of people in the line ahead of you. That's the work in progress. And then the throughput is the output over a defined per unit time. Okay, so in, in this it might be the number of customers that we serve in an hour. Okay, so if we can compare our throughput um, um, or our, our lead time to our tack time, then that can tell us something about how well we're performing or are we performing enough. Now, this, this thing called Little's Law relates all those, all those three. And so, um, uh, and it relates it in this equation that lead time is equal to whip divided by exit rate. So <clears throat> the interesting thing is that uh, if you look at this, this equation, what would be, instead of working on lead time directly, what would be, what would be, uh, uh, remember, we want short lead times, right? The idea is we want to shorten our lead time. What might be some ideas in terms of how you would improve lead time that are not directly related to moving faster? What's one big idea that should come from this? Hmm. Increase Wait. the number of people available to help customers? Uh, you reduce, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not asking so you to get a rather obvious answer. It's, it's reduce whip, right? So what right. you said, John, mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense, right? And it's geared at, hey, we can, if we can reduce the whip, we can, we can uh, get this, uh, we can reduce the lead time a lot, right? So if you imagine standing in line at Subway or something like that, um, if you go in and there's no people in front of you, they can get it to you really quickly, right? You don't have to wait that long. But if you're standing in line before, before everybody else, they all have to be served before you. And that's what's taking all the time. It's not how fast the person is doing. It's not the, it's not the speed at which the person is doing it. And I think this is where John was getting. It's the, it, it's the amount of delay that you're experiencing where he's, that person is not working on what you want them to be working on. Now, part of this we just have to deal with. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not one of these one-size-fits-all maniacs. Lean works great where it works great. Um, you know, if you go to Subway, uh, people used to talk about the difference between McDonald's and Subway, and I don't know how McDonald's is anymore. But when I was younger, I worked at McDonald's for like two years, and what we would do is we would, when there was lunch uh, rush that came up, what, what we would do is we would fill the bins with all sorts of products. So when people got in, we'd build up an inventory, you see. And um, the problem was, of course, that if people didn't buy that, we'd have to throw it out. So it created a lot of waste. So uh, what Subway did is they figured out how to not create a lot of waste and service people very quickly. And the breakdown in that is, of course, when you don't have enough servers, Subway takes forever. Um, so I don't know if McDonald's changed their model or anything. I haven't been to McDonald's in many years. Um, so um, happily, by the way. Um, so anyway, but that's the idea, <clears throat> is that lead time can be affected by looking at other things. If we can kind of remove the junk that's in the way, um, then we can get there quicker. All right, here's just an example. In this case, we have a sales department that completes five quotes per day. Um, uh, another word that you often see for exit rate is ACR, which is average completion rate. Average completion rate through foot, ACR, all mean the same thing. It's one of the difficulties. There's so much language uh, repetitiveness. On average, there are 22 quotes in various stages in the department. Applying Little's Law, we get the following. The lead time is equal to whip divided by the average completion rate. So it's 22 divided by 5. So the typical lead time is going to be 4.4 days. If we put something in the hopper and say, hey, I want to quote on this, we should wait about 4.4 days. Now, <clears throat> who cares, right? I mean, why do I care about Little's Law and all this stuff? Well, one of the things that's kind of neat about it is lead time is often difficult to measure. However, throughput is usually a snap. Usually this is very easy to measure. 
And WIP is usually fairly easy. So very often you can measure lead time uh, or you can get an idea of lead time by simply looking at uh, the WIP and the throughput. And um, it's an easier way to do it. So um, if there's a nice idea that you can take from this, it's sort of like um, it's in your bag of tricks of saying, how can we measure something? This is a nice way to be able to do it or to be able to back out to the, into that. Okay. And um, that's all I wanted to cover here. So before I move on, what questions are there about, excuse me, about the tack, tack time, lead time, or tack time, lead time, cycle time, throughput or exit rate or ACR, all the same thing, um, and Little's Law. What questions do you have? Okay. I do want to, um, before we move on, <clears throat> I do want to very quickly look at this exercise on slide 34 because I do want you to really try it. I don't want to give it away. Um, but here we've got a, a, a sales process that we're showing the, the throughput. Here, it doesn't say that on here. I guess it says it right there, sales. So this is the kind of thing in, in a company that you don't want to see, right? Sales is going down over time. So <clears throat> uh, what would be the typical thing that you might do um, uh, to deal with this, that a company might do to deal with, oh, sales are going down? What would be some typical things that a company might do? Increase the number of sales reps. Yeah, increase our sales reps. That might be one. How about something else? What's another idea? Come on, guys. I know you can think of some ideas for, in, for increasing sales. How about spend advertising dollars? How about another one? Price. What's that? <laughs> Change the price. Change the price. Okay. Well, Excellent. So there's lots of different things that, that companies could or would or, or could do. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take a process view of this and we're going to show how capacity, how just essentially thinking about your capacity might be a good way to do it. So one thing to do uh, with this is when people talk about sales, people often, by the way, sales are very open to, they're a very ripe area to get a lot of value out of Lean Six Sigma, huge area. Um, uh, partly because uh, wins there uh, can create extra revenue, which companies really like. Um, salespeople are very, um, uh, gen as a general rule, don't like to go into talking about Six Sigma stuff, but they'll love to talk about process. Um, and usually, here's a typical sort of sales process. I prospect, I interview, I present, I close, I make closes. Um, so <clears throat> what happens if we would get some data on exit rate and on WIP, um, you know, sort of using our example um, to do that. And so that's what's shown in the, in the data here. Let's see, where are we? Sales process right here. So this is for this uh, particular problem. Here's what, you're, here's what you're looking at. You're looking at the sales. Um, that was the, uh, these are the two columns that you were looking at in that graph. What I'd like you to do is you're given for each one of these process steps, and by the way, I think I wrote interviewing instead of qualifying in the slide. Those both mean the same thing. Interviewing is the same as qualifying. Um, I'd like you to look at the time series plots for all of these things at the different areas, and maybe use Little's Law, that might help you, um, to give some advice to what this company might do. Where might the problem lie? And uh, why, you know, the typical things like hiring more sales reps might not work so well. Um, but anyway, see if you can come up, look at this, come up with any insights, and uh, make a recommendation or two um, to, see if, uh, to see if you can help them improve by looking at um, these, these, these things. And use Little's Law. Okay, that's a huge hint. <laughs> but make graphs. Uh, graphs are very helpful. If you make graphs of what these things are doing over time, what each of these are doing over time, things should pop out. Okay, and if you have questions, please give me a call. All right, so hopefully I didn't give too much away there. 
Um, but um, um, and that's it for uh, that's it for the lean uh, metrics. That's all I wanted to cover for that today. Um, so before we go on, what questions do you have on lean metrics? Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay, maybe straightforward, but it's different. A lot of people don't do it, so um, it might be worth doing. Okay, um, let's. Um, now we covered lean tools, the nuts and bolts tools, last time. So I'd like to go to slide 56 and talk about lean solutions. And just to talk about some principles and some examples here. Um, um, I just We'll talk about this <clears throat> when we get to the improve phase, but right now I just wanted to, to give you an idea of what some of these things are that are out there. Lean in some ways is very solution oriented. It says, you know, here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, find the waste and then we'll use a technique, <coughs> a specific technique to, to, help, uh, to help reduce that race, that, that race, that, uh, that waste. Here are some examples. Uh, one piece flow, cellular flow, load balancing, which is kind of what we talked about before. It's all about managing your capacity, quick changeover, and pull systems. Now, I'll just show you very briefly what each of these are. Um, and each of these is geared toward doing two things, increasing speed and uh, removing delays. And they often try and regulate, and make many of these things even out the steps and uh, remove delays and then also kind of uh, balance them a little bit more. So th that's kind of the picture of what you're trying to do with any or all of these things. Remove delays, increase speed regulate it a little bit more, make it a little more regular instead of short, short, long, short, really short. Um, instead of doing that, maybe regulate the steps and so forth. Okay, so the first thing is one piece flow. And again, think of it in terms of uh, McDonald's versus Subway. Um, <clears throat> McDonald's, we're making a big batch of things. It takes generally a long time to make that batch. Other things are delayed while that batch is finishing. Um, very often, one piece flow uh, can solve some of that. Um, so one piece flow means essentially you make one unit at a time. There are some negative things uh, with respect to that as well, but um, 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 that's this is sort of the picture. The idea is that if we're looking at um, batch processing, here we're putting 10, 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, through. And the idea is we can't go to step two. Not all processes are like this, but sometimes they are. We don't go to step two until we've completed. All of these are complete in step one. The problem is the first one here is being delayed by the last one over here. So there tends to be a lot of delays when you do batch processing. The idea with one piece flow is you kind of regulate that. So as soon as this first one is, is finished, it goes into step two, and then that second one can be finished, and then it goes into step three. So you're starting to get the finish right there instead of waiting till the first one goes through all, all three steps. I'm sorry, until all of them go through all three steps. So you can reduce, essentially it's a way of reducing lead time, not necessarily cycle time. So you've got to watch out for that one. It's a, it's a nice idea. Sometimes it really works. Uh, it really does work for lead time, it's not always the least expensive uh, fix, though. Sometimes there are expenses associated with it. For example, with Subway, in order to do it fast, they need to pre-manage all their inventories, like you know whatever those little bins are that they put out for bacon or, or uh, that. And all that takes preparation. It takes time to do that. Um, another idea is to, that can reduce waste is cellular flow. And the idea, this is often good for reducing transportation list, uh, waste. The idea is you design your workspace so that you work it <clears throat> such, such that at the end, you're, at, where you finish is where you want to, uh, is where you want to be. So for example, uh, think about your kitchen. If you have a, I have an old house. I have one built in 1860. So my kitchen is not at all like this. But many modern kitchens are like this. They're made for you to bring in food. Uh, directly into the garage, right? You have your car in the garage, then you have like a little mud room, and then the kitchen's right there. 
so you can put food in your refrigerator, there are shelves, there's a sink, so you can work on and doing the prep uh, over here. Um, then you put in your food, and then there's a service area right there. Scraps go right in the garbage, which then goes to the garage, and you're all set. So it minimizes a lot of uh, a lot of transportation waste. Um, load balancing, I think, is fairly straightforward. Um, this picture is not so good, but this is maybe a little bit better. If we have uh, um, if we have uh, different amounts of time that different steps take. Uh, we might want to figure out how to load balance that. Again, this isn't doesn't need to be rocket science. We might be able to staff a little bit more in step two than in step one uh, because the uh, the step two takes a little bit more time. So balancing out that load. Um, it's a very common thing that people talk about, but don't often do it because it's not all that it's not always that easy. Uh, moving people around is one thing, but redesigning work. Uh, so it can be more regular is another thing that's often difficult to do, but can be a strong idea. Um, one thing that's not always talked about is quick changeover. Um, so quick changeover, this happens a lot in manufacturing processes, but it happens a tremendous amount of time in transactional processes too. A lot of time, uh, when people study processes, a lot of time is very often uh, given up to changing over in the classical uh, manufacturing, um, it was found that um, when people were running manufacturing lines, if they wanted to change from one product to another, it often took a lot of delays because you had to retool all the machines that were in there, change the tooling, uh, and uh, often change a lot of other things. Um, so originally, quick changeover was things like um, <laughs> Um, one one uh, place where I worked where they made prosthetic limbs, um, they made tons of different models of prosthetic limbs. They had these. Um, it was really it was really pretty amazing. They had these beams that they could pull up or push down on uh, that were all the way to the ceiling, and they had like five or six different sets of tools which they could just hydraulically lift or bring down to get the right tools so I could switch over from making, I'm making this up a little bit, but, but from making knee replacements to uh, making elbow replacements um, uh, very quickly. Um, it was pretty amazing, um, all the stuff they had done. However, in the transaction world, there's a lot of times where we uh, waste, uh, or we, we, there's a lot of waste between changeovers with things like um, uh, I'm working on one account, now I'm going to work on another account. I might have to get my files in order. I might have to change uh, the directory that I'm looking at. I might have to use a different template. I might have to log out of Salesforce and log back in. So sometimes that, uh, th those areas are ripe to um, remove a lot of waste. And that's what it is. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, and the last one, which is probably the most esoteric, is essentially pull systems and something called Kanban. So Kanban just means cards. It's a card system that the Japanese invented. Um, let me see if I can make the picture. Sometimes the picture doesn't help all that much anyway. But the idea here is, um, and remember that uh, uh, that uh, value stream map that we looked at last time. It was really complicated. And I mentioned that in one of them, you know what, let me see if I can pull up that picture. Let me see if I can pull up that picture pretty quickly. Um, I think it's on slide. You don't have to go back to it, but I'm going to go back to it very quickly. It's on slide 41. So on slide 41, I think I made the comment that there's often a lot of waste when you do central control because sometimes people are waiting for central control to push through. And instead, you want to design your processes, or maybe a better design for processes, sometimes having what's called a pull system instead of a push system. Here we're pushing. Central control will say, OK, now it's ready for you to give uh, data entry for you to give your get requirements uh, team uh, the data. And inventory is building up. Well, if they're ready, they should be able to pull from you in order to get it, in order to drive that sort of that that the other things. 
Um, so in this case, you know, it's pulling from the back that's going to be pulling from here and here and here and so on. Um, all right, and that's what's sort of being depicted here. Here in step four, when I'm ready, I'm going to be pulling from step three. <clears throat> and if that leaves them empty, that's going to then pull from step two and so forth. And that does two things. One is it can help speed up this process by reducing delays. But the other thing that Kanban does that's really good is it can reduce inventories. It can allow you to keep smaller inventories such that you don't pull until your inventories are out. Um, I think we also talked a little bit before about how demand can sometimes make that a bit of a dangerous proposition. So sometimes if you have a, a widely varying demand, it's not smart to leave zero inventory everywhere. Um, you know, zero inventory in raw materials or zero inventory in people. So um, this can uh, this can be an effective thing. You know, um, the um, I was I read up on this now. This is a long time ago, but my reading originally, um, I think that the, the the Japanese executive. One of the stories about this is that the Japanese executives who invented this really didn't invent it. They they kind of saw it at uh, they went to like the precursors of Seven Elevens back in the '60s in New York City. Uh, so these little uh, 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 bodegas, as they're called today, um, at one of the places they went to. They, they had very small amounts of inventory, and they were kind of shocked. They said, you know, there's maybe two or three bags of chips uh, of a certain brand, two or three bags of pretzels, but no more than that. And um, the question came back to say, well, where do you keep your inventory? And they said, we don't. We, keep, we just have the, the trucks come by every day, and we tell them what we want. And I said, well, isn't that more expensive? And they said, yeah, but it's less expensive than keeping a whole warehouse full of pretzels and chips and milk and all that kind of stuff. So that's what the Japanese then did. They developed uh, systems such that it managed that in a much more systematic way. And that's just what Kanban is. A car, originally, it's a card system. OK. So um, we'll ask you to do this. And I think that um, um, uh, we'll ask you to do this. But just to give a few examples in this, um, um, you know, with cellular flow, a restaurant's really uh, can, can can be pretty obvious that that works pretty well. You you order it so that the entrance and exit to the kitchen are. You can order your kitchen such that you're completing the dishes closer to where they're picked up and so forth. Um, you can see how some of these things work. All right, um, let's pause a little bit, um, and I'd like you to write down a couple of things for. Uh, let's just take a like a one minute break. You can write down a couple of things in here. Like I said, we'll come back to these later when we're talking about um, when we're talking about the improve uh, uh, section. But I wanted to have you at least um, see this now, so that when people start, to, oh, you know, you're learning about lean. Oh, did you learn about one piece flow or something like that? Well, yeah, it's a solution. We're going to talk about it um, um, anyway. That's what's out there. Let's take a minute. And then we'll get going on the uh, team tools. Okay. Uh, now, I think many of you will be very familiar with a lot of these tools. Um, but uh, let's just turn to, if we turn to slide, uh, not 73. <laughs> um, uh, well, let's just stay on this for just a second. The, the key thing to, to see about this is that, yeah, we're navigating through. And in general, we're working in the analyze phase. And that's what's going to be um, uh, right now. This is where we're talking. 
Uh, however, you'll notice that you can use these all over the place and you can use them. This is such a great general purpose tool. You can use these in your everyday, um, if you have a, a meeting or a work session or something like that, you can speed it up or help it or whatever. So um, lots of areas where you can use this. Now here are the tools that we're going to talk about. Now there are, I like to talk about convergent and divergent tools. So divergent tools are things that get a group to think more broadly. Um, now there's lots of different divergent tools that are in here. Uh, we're going to talk about only two of them. The divergent tools that we're going to talk about, or, or the main divergent tool, I'll just say one is the main one, and this is it's brainstorming. Now many of you have probably done this before. Uh, we'll, we'll try a specific type called structured brainstorming. Then there are convergent tools. These fishbone and affinity are <clears throat> are grouping tools. These are grouping tools. So they help us take our brainstormed ideas and group them so we can make sense of them. One of the problems with brainstorming is it generates a lot of things but not a lot of action, um, a lot of thoughts. Um, so how do we rein in and understand those? And then we're going to talk about, we will talk about the C and E matrix some other time, not this time. Um, We'll talk about multi-voting, and this is a prioritization. Priority. I'll keep it short. Uh, this is a prioritization tool, and you'll see exactly how it works. Um, so, um, and hopefully we'll be able to do it, uh, do it live uh, with you. And we'll talk about these uh, specifically. Um, th these, these are tools that, that can help you go deeper as well. Um, Remember I said that the phrase I want us to remember is BAM. And BAM will get you a heck of a, long, uh, a lot of places. That stands for Brainstorm, Affinity, Multivote. So this right here, this arc right there, is BAM session. And um, we're going to go ahead and we're actually going to do one of those. <clears throat> All right, now how many, uh, I, I can't see the hands, but I'm guessing that most of you are pretty familiar with brainstorming. Are you pretty familiar with it? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, so without being ridiculous about it, we'll be, we'll be quick. What are some of the key things about brainstorming? You tell me. Having the right people in the room. Brainstorming. Got it. Right people? Nothing's off limits. Nothing's off limits. No discussion. Great. No discussion. What do you mean by that, Steve? Don't debate um, not the different uh, points that people make. Just list them. Just list. Right. And sometimes also don't, don't explain either. Don't spend right. a lot of time explaining sort of why you think it's right. We already agreed that we're not going to discuss that right now. We're, we're assuming it's okay. All right, what else? Do we want just a couple of good ideas? No, lots of ideas. Lots of ideas. It's quantity, not quality, right? We're not looking for quality here. We're looking for quantity. And I think to this one, you know, crazy ideas are fine. Okay. Um, now I'm going to put this separately. I think that we've kind of danced around that. And there's no criticism, right? No criticism of any ideas. All right. So far, this all makes sense. Now, how do you guys usually brainstorm? What's an, uh, how do you how do you usually conduct a brainstorming session? Oh, just give me an example. Get everyone into the room. Bring everybody into the room. Okay. Then what? Get out a whiteboard or a piece of paper or whatever and just start listing ideas. Whiteboard and list. So do you have a scribe or a, a facilitator? Yeah, usually one of each. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, that's a great idea. And I'm doing that right now, right? Um, so I, I'm going to show you a slightly different uh, method. And um, I'm going to put oh, one other thing, and I think 
um, Steve was really getting to this in his point, put a time limit on it. Time limits are good. Time limits actually increase cre uh, creativity. Um, if you put a little bit, not too much pressure on people, uh, can help them move a little bit faster and actually create more ideas. So we're going to do something called structured brainstorming. And uh, I call it the write it, say it, throw it. Throw it method. Well, we can't throw it right now because we're, um, because we're doing this uh, uh, virtually. So we're going to try and do this virtually and, uh, and see how it goes. All right, so we'll, we're going to try it. <laughs> uh, I don't know how well this is going to go. I've done it before once or twice. But um, the first thing I'm going to do is why don't we, uh, uh, well, let me, let me ask you. Um, I'll just ask you, uh, uh, do people typically come or sometimes come late for meetings at your, uh, at your company? All the time. All the time. All right. So what if we were going to try and eliminate that? We might want to start with saying, why do people come late for meetings, right? Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to brainstorm uh, why people come late for meetings. Now, normally, if I were in the same room, I'd have everybody have uh, their own small stack of sticky notes. And I would say, I want you to write down on a different uh, sticky note. Um, I want you to write down all the different reasons why you think people come late to meetings, right? Um, so here, you know, just so that we all get the idea, we're going to do this in just a second. But just so that we all get the idea, you know, there's no, I want you to write down all the ideas. Be brief if you can. But I want you to write down all the ideas that you think of. Like, for example, if uh, uh, we were brainstorming ideas for how to use a rake, uh, Steve, what would be one way, or John, what would be one way of using a rake? Um, what could you do with a rake? I, uh, use two hands on it. I could use two hands Standing on it. Up. Okay, got it. Well, uh, uh, and uh, Mike, what would be a way that you could use a rake? Um, or what would you use a rake for? Let's put it that rake way. Up leaves, yeah. yeah, you could rake leaves with it. Tammy, what would be another way that you could use a rake? Um, pick up some garbage that's spilled in the driveway. You could pick up garbage. Okay, uh, Regina, what would be a way you could use a rake? What would you use a rake for? I could swat at a critter in my yard. I could swat at a critter in my... Okay, great. All great examples, right? I could use it to stake a tomato plant. Whatever. Um, all great. Uh, all great. Um, now, what we're going to do is instead, we're going to brainstorm, why do people come late to meetings? Okay? So be brief. And what I'd like you to do is take a piece of paper, and in the next, uh, I'm going to put a minute and a half on the clock, and I'd like you to write down as many as you can, uh, as many ideas for why people come late to meetings as you can in a minute and a half, okay? All right, let's go. Okay, let's stop.
Um, I'm sure that you, there's others that you can come up with. And, and by the way, as we're, as we're going through this exercise, feel free to write down others. But right now, um, what we're going to do, and now, if, you, if we had been using sticky notes and you had a whiteboard and you were doing it in a room, this is even better because you, you, you'd, be, you'd be further along. Um, but I don't know why I'm trying to arrange this too much. Um, you'd be further along already. Um, all you'd have to do is have people sort of throw them up on a whiteboard, and we could do the next uh, the next step. Um, but um, and you know, uh, and this is kind of what I was saying, or a part of what in the example that Mike gave, where hey, we have a whiteboard, somebody's writing down some ideas, and I do this all the time. I do that all the time. But you know, there's some there are some issues. One is I become a bottleneck for the time that it takes, and number two is um, uh, number two is I become a uh, I become a filter for it too. So sometimes it becomes my words. Unfortunately, we're going to have a little bit of that going on right now. But um, um, let's see if I can get this back up. There it is, my sticky notes. Okay. So what I'd like to do is kind of go around the room, uh, the virtual room, and get everybody's um, get everybody's um, sticky. So let's do one at a time. Let's start with uh, John. What's one of your ideas? Why do people come late to meetings? No consequences. No consequences. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve. Not interested. Not interested. Okay. Uh, Michael. Uh, the last meeting ended late. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, Regina. Regina. Stopped on the way to the meeting. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Tammy. Not paying attention to the time. Okay, great. Uh, John, let's just keep going around. Uh, a reminder was not sent out the day of. Okay. Uh, Steve. Traveling from far. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask you guys just today to do something that I normally wouldn't, and that is if I were doing this in a room, I would let people say everything that they have, and I wouldn't try and take out the duplicates. But just because we are in a time situation today and we're doing it virtually, I'm going to ask you if you do have something that truly is a duplicate, you just move on to the next one, if that makes sense. Okay, Mike. Uh, they had the wrong dial-in info. Oh, yes. Okay, Gina. I'm just looking at my list. I put uh, unfamiliar with location. Okay, I'm sp my spelling is not good here. Tammy. Um, they were in the bathroom. Okay. Uh, John. Too many meetings and not taken seriously. Okay. Uh, Steve. Late invitation. Okay. Mike. Uh, they were finishing up something else that thought was more important, another email or task or something. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Gina. Uh, I have a calendar or technology issues. Okay. Let's put those as two. Okay. Uh, Tammy? Lunch took too long at the restaurant. They were late. Okay, great. Uh, let's go through one more round of this. Uh, John? 
do not use a standardized meeting room. Okay. Uh, Steve? Just out of, hab out of habit. Out of habit? This came late because it's what they do. Okay. Good. I'll, you know, I'm not going to make any comments. Let's go. <laughs> no discussion, right? i got to live up to that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Mike? <laughs> yeah, it might be more of a root cause type, but to me, um, maybe they don't understand the re repercussions of being late downstream effects. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Gina? I had bio break. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tammy? They're on the phone. Okay. Um, all right. So obviously we would normally keep going on this. Um, we would normally keep going on this. But uh, I'm going to stop here uh, for time reasons so that I don't screw you guys up too much um, the rest of the day as well, uh, given some of these things. All right, so uh, even so, I mean, we took a minute and a half, and if we just kind of stop here, if you can imagine you're in the room and you're throwing sticky notes or whatever, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22 uh, ideas or Thanks for why. And my guess is that a number of you have like three or four left anyway, and we can keep going. Okay, so that's the first part, and hopefully um, I've convinced you that this can be this can be helpful. Um, not to not to belabor the point, but often when I do this, it's it's good for a team to kind of get up and use their bodies. Now we can't do it so much virtually, but if you're in a room, getting people up and putting sticky notes and talking a little bit about what this is and getting them to throw the sticky notes. They flop in weird ways and they go and then they have to pick them up and people make jokes about it. It's, it's, a, it's a good, uh, it's a fun thing to do. It's a more fun thing to do than listen to somebody, you know, writing up on a, on a, on a whiteboard, as you know. Okay, so, so that's, um, I'm going to move on past brainstorming. There's lots of other things that are in here that you can read, but I think we're good. Uh, I do want to talk about the uh, the next tool, which is the affinity diagram. Now, um, uh, here's just a picture of what it is. You start with a bunch of sticky notes, and essentially you organize them into categories. That's basically what it is. The trick here is twofold. You actually don't start out with the categories. You just let people organize them into groups, and then you put names so the the organization comes first, and then you put names on them. So that's important. And the second thing is that it's done silently with people not talking to each other. So you're not saying, oh, those two things go together. No, you're saying, let's move the sticky notes that, are, uh, that have an affinity, that are close in idea. Let's move those, de uh, those close physically and... Um, and then we can put names on those. Uh, we can discuss the last part. Obviously, we're not going to put names on them without some discussion. But um, that's the way it works. Um, so, uh, and it, it's surprisingly, I, I, I make no bones about it. We're going to, well, that was, a, that was actually a very bad pun, you'll find out. Um, not on purpose. But there's another tool that we're going to use called the fishbone. I make no bones about it. I find the affinity better for most teams and most applications. Um, but I, I, so let's, um, uh, uh, the difference between this and the fishbone tool, have you guys used fishbone tools before? Have you seen this fishbone before? Uh, or who, who has, I guess? I've seen it, but not very familiar with using it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk it through a little bit. Um, but what I'd like to do is let's give a shot to the affinity diagram, shall we? So, in, so affinity diagram basically works like this. We've got our sticky notes, which hopefully you can still see. And then you have the team go up to the whiteboard or wherever you're putting it, and you have them organize them 
um, uh, uh, you have them organize them by moving some things together. Uh, now we can't exactly do that, but what I'm going to do is I've given you all the ability to move stuff on my screen, and I'm going to, yeah, so if you're moving stuff around, I see Regina moves some stuff around. So normally I wouldn't say do it one at a time, but let's, um, let's see if we can do that. So, uh, so Gina, why don't you move a couple together that you think, um, take a shot at moving some of these together. And, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, again, normally I wouldn't tell people to stop. Like if you're doing this in a room, you want to just have people kind of move around a little bit, have, a, have some space so that they can circulate. But you want people, you know, moving things around and seeing how things work and being next to, to each other. Uh, Tammy, why don't, you try, uh, why don't you try moving a few things around now? And you can move things away if uh, you know if you don't you didn't like how how Gina organized things. You can choose a different organization. Can you see mine? I don't think mine's working. It's working a little bit. I think you have to grab the top, not the bottom. Yeah. yeah there you go. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, um, and uh, now uh, Michael, why don't you take a or Mike, why don't you take a, a shot at moving a couple? Okay. Uh, great. Now, um, uh, let's see. Um, Steve, if there's any that you want to move, um, why don't you go ahead and move a couple or, or let me know if you don't. Uh, I move these with that over here. Uh, I'll just put it beside it. Okay. And this one, this side, I know. This okay. Side. Okay. I think that's it for me. Okay. Now, um, uh, Steve, you and I will, uh, you and I will uh, 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 maybe uh, put. The, we'll do. We'll deal with the name, so I don't want to leave you out. Um, but I think you get the. I think you all get the picture, right? And usually, it's it's shocking. Even if you have fifty of these, um, and people are doing it, uh, you know, moving it back and forth. Uh, usually you end up with about like three or four categories um, and it works this way. So now I, I guess I'd like to um, just with uh, with Mike and, and Steve. So 
um, just so I can understand that bottom group a little bit more. So Steve, why did you move those out of habit and no consequences closer to the that other group? Uh, I think it goes into the mindset of the person who's invited to the meeting to make sure they get there on time and how important it is to be there on time. Okay. And and Mike, what, what was your reasoning in having those separate? I think, I don't know if they were already separate or not, um, mm -hmm. but I, I agree to me it's more of there's a person, you know, there's a people aspect to that bottom group that's more training related, communication related. Right. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, that makes sense. Um, and uh, what I was what I was thinking is that sometimes I've seen people put things like this because, um, yeah, they're people related, but this is sort of like culture versus uh, and sometimes even the too many meetings. But why don't we move this uh, culture as a company culture as opposed to to people? Yeah, we we allow this to go on, so that's why I continue. Um, okay. I think I understand this. Um, so I, I hope we're reasonably comfortable, at least in terms of we know where we're going. So um, uh, Steve, let's put a name to each one of these groups, uh, so or a label. So I'll let you give the label. So what would we call this first group? Uh, I'm going to struggle. <laughs> Capacity issue, maybe? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, Steve. I said Steve. I'm 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 at John. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the well, the first two. Well, actually, all three. I would say would be uh, company culture issues, or yeah, maybe culture. Okay. Um, Let's just call that culture then. Good. All right. How about this one? Um, a reminder. How, I would say, I don't know if logistical or tech, well, technology, um, I'd say technology probably. Uh, technology. Maybe logistical. Logistics, okay. Or organization, yeah, organization, uh, yeah. All right, let's say logistics. Now, now, by the way, if you're doing this with a team, we do want to take more time than what we're taking right now. No question about it. Uh, we want to definitely take a little more time. Um, all right. Uh, how about this one? Um, I would say um, individual initiative, uh, employee initiative, lack of. Um, All right. Those are pretty PC terms for bio break and then we're in the bathroom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, what, what did you say? Individual initiative, initiative. or motivation initiative i was thinking of lunch taking too long the bathroom might be a okay board, so. <laughs> right all right how about this this group down here um i would say that would be as much as it could be a personal issue i think it'd be cultural a company culture issue hmm. so do you think that this uh, is the same then that these should be well, moved in? no well no i guess it would be well, what's going on with the company that the people feel that way? But I guess ultimately it is an individual issue uh, that should be reinforced or strengthened. So, yeah, I would say personnel, um, I don't know, personnel desire, motivation. Um, yeah, how about motivation? Motivation. Let's leave it at that. Okay, and how about this over here? Uh, I would say that... Um, facilitate the meetings. Um, there could be logistics as well. Uh, if they use the same meeting room over and over, um, calendar technology, uh, planning maybe, maybe planning. Planning, okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of similarity with some of these. And, you know, if we worked on them a little bit longer, maybe we would move some of this in there and have sub-organizations and stuff like that. But um, Hopefully you get the tool, right? Uh, this is a tool that you can use pretty quickly and, and all that. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it would be fairly quick, especially if you're using, um, you know, if you're using uh, sticky notes to be able to simply move these around um, and uh, rename them or you know, whatever you want. Uh, I can't remember whether this was over there or, or stopped in the way of meeting or whatever. 
was there, but the um, um, I see what's going on. All right, but in any event, I think you get the I think you get the picture, and it's something that we can do pretty quickly. Um, all right, now um, we'll get the fishbone in a second, but the difference between fishbone and uh, affinity is essentially fishbone. You start out by drawing the fish. Let me just take a look at that. Whoops. Why did it go back? There we go. In fishbone, you essentially draw the fish beforehand, and then you usually have a facilitator. You usually have a facilitator, like, go through and say, okay, now we're talking about bio break. Should that be... Uh, uh, should that be people? Should it be policies? Should it be materials? Should it be environment or procedures? And by the way, usually these are fairly standardized. Now, the only thing I can tell you is that even though they're fairly standardized, the exact five or six will differ from the text that you look in. So in this one, we have policies, materials, environment, people, and procedures. Um, sometimes people will put in uh, 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 information technology. Sometimes people will put in measurements uh, or machines is another one. Um, but um, the idea is you put these up first, and then as you brain, as you when you finish the brainstorming, you simply stick the sticky notes into each of these categories. Okay, so that's the difference. And the and the picture that we would have in our head is instead of vacation problems, this is then uh, late to meeting. All right, we're trying to look at these being the causes, these over here being the causes for this effect. And so that, that way, uh, sometimes it's cause, called fishbone, sometimes it's called cause and effect. I like fishbone because that's what it looks like, that people remember the name of the tool. But this can be substituted with affinity. Affinity, you just, you don't have the categories beforehand, you develop the categories as you go forward. Does that make sense to everybody? Hopefully that does. Yeah. Good. Either one of these is effective. So I gave my clear preference for affinity, but you can use a fishbone, and it works. It, it works extremely well. Um, so if you feel that affinity may be too complicated or confusing for somebody, all right. Now I want to go into the last thing, and it's called multi-voting. And um, let's just do it first, and uh, then we'll understand what it is, and then we can comment on what's good and what's bad on it. So here's what multi-voting is, and I'm, I'm purposely doing this. In multi-voting, you basically give people additional votes. You give them the, the power to vote for more than one thing. So it's as if you went into the last uh, presidential election, and let's suppose I gave you three votes, and you said, well, if I'm a Democrat, I might vote three for Barack Obama. If I were a Republican, I might have cast my vote three times for Mitt Romney. If I were indifferent, I might have said, well, let me give one vote to Obama, one vote to Romney, and I don't know, one vote to Ralph Nader, because I'm sure he was running, or whatever. Uh, or maybe I want to, you know, if I'm slightly Democrat, I'd give two to Obama and one to Romney, whatever. I think you get the picture, or the, the, I think you get the idea of what's going on with multi-voting. But the idea is you have more than one uh, you have more than one vote. Now, the way that we usually do this is um, the way that we usually do this is <clears throat> we want to spread out our votes such that if everybody voted only one and one vote on every one of these, we'd have about one dot on each. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. Let me erase that now. Here's what I mean. I think I counted up. We had 22 stickies, right? Or 22, yeah, stickies. And we have uh, we have six people, the five of you, and me. So if I divide 22 by six, I get. Uh, let me think. Let me think. I get three, <laughs> but I'm going to give us all four votes because uh, I'm going to round up. So I get three and a little bit more than three. So I round up. It's almost 24. So I'm going to give everybody four votes. So here's what, I, here's what you vote on. What you do is you say, I want you to tell me, you know, cast your votes for what you think are the most important, the most important reasons why people are late. Okay? 
And the idea is you would put them directly on the sticky notes. All right, so for example, if I thought the only thing that, the only thing that matters with this is that there's um, two, is that the people are always taking bio breaks, I would cast all four of my votes on bio, on bio breaks. Get it? If, on the other hand, I thought other things were important, if I thought, well, the reason why is people aren't taking it seriously and uh, there's no consequences uh, and there's too many meetings and, yeah, we, we end our meetings late. I could spread out my votes that way. Either one is fine. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to, uh, each of us, to take 30 seconds, no more, and to think about where you want to put your four dots. You have four dots, and I'm going to try and just uh, spread these out so we can read them a little bit better. That's all. That's all I'm trying to do this. But as I'm doing this, think about where you want to put your dots. Okay. I think that's good. Four dots. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, have you all gotten your dots written down? Yep. Okay. I'm going to take your word for it. Uh, one person said yes. <laughs> so let's go through, um, and um, I'm going to tell, oops. Um, I would like you to, um, what's it, I'm just going to erase all of it. And I'd like you to tell me where you want me to, to put dots on these. Now, again, if you're in the same room, um, you can um, you can easily do it. If you're on the phone, you have to take people's word for it, and there's a lot of trust issues that are trust issues. There's a lot of trust that you have to give to people. So I'm trusting you guys um, to do this. So let's go through. So Gina, where would you like to put your four dots? Uh, I would like to put uh, one dot on the last meeting ended late. Okay. Uh, too many meetings would be my next thought. One. Mm -hmm. And then I just had, um, we're finishing up another task deemed more important. Okay. And my fourth thought actually should go with um, uh, last meeting ended late. Okay, got it. All right. Now let's go through this, uh, let's go through this pretty quickly. So, uh, Steve, where did you put your dots? I have two unstopped on the way there. Stopped on the way there. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. And then one on too many meeting, and and one on uh, out of habit. Okay, Mike. Put um one on the last meeting ended late. One on too many meetings. One on don't understand repercussions. And okay. one on fin or finishing up another test. Okay. Uh, Tammy? I have not paying attention to time. We're stopped on the way there. No consequences. Well, hold on. Stopped on the way. Okay. No consequences. I got it. And another task was deemed more important. Oh, yeah, right there. We're finishing up another task deemed more important. Oh, this right here. Okay, got it. Uh-huh. All right, let's see. John? Two on no consequences. One on too many meetings. And one on uh, not taken seriously. Okay, did I get everybody? Is there somebody that I missed? I missed me. Um, so where did I have mine? I put two dots on this one, and I put uh, uh, one dot on this and uh, one dot on this. I thought this was a good one. So 
so here it is right here. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, we got all these ideas, and now this is our prioritization for them, right? So there's two things that we can do here. One is <clears throat> um, we can glean out of this to say, you know what we need to focus on? If we're going to fix this problem, we need to focus on the things that have lots of dots. Namely, whoops, I'm going to circle with a different color here. Namely, we're going to focus on why are there so many meetings? Maybe there are solutions with, with respect to that. Or we're finishing other, up another important task. Uh, or no consequences. Or last meeting ended late. OK, so that's the first thing that we can do. And hopefully that makes a lot of sense and it's pretty straightforward, right? We look at where the dots are, and that can help us. Oh, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, uh, the second thing that we can do is, did you notice that some of these right here were spread out within the category? Like there's one out of habit, there's two no, con there's one no, there's a few no consequences, a couple of don't understand what's going on, not tickets. This area might be a whole area that we might want to focus. Let's focus on seeing if we can behaviorally shape some of these. I think, uh, John, you called them personnel, right? Personnel issues. Uh, yeah. I'm going to pretend I spelled that right. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I'm going to pretend I spelled that right. But anyway, maybe we focus on that entire area. So there's two different ways that you can drill down into this and take it away. Um, Multi-voting, I'll tell you. Brainstorm, affinity, multi-voting, a BAM session, or again, you can substitute Fishbone for that. Very quick way to come to consensus with a group, or not consensus, but at least a common understanding of how to, how to really narrow down and work on a problem, um, if that makes sense. Very powerful and yet very simple tool. Now, I want to ask you, uh, what were some... What were some potential, uh, hopefully, hopefully you found that this was a good exercise and something that you could use. Um, let me ask you, though, in terms of, uh, of multi-voting, what might be some issues with respect to multi-voting when you go to use it? If, um, if you thought one was more, more of a driver, you would use all your dots in one spot? Well, I think that's okay, though. That's that's what you want to. That's what you want to get. You want to get people like if if they feel that one thing is a driver, put them all there. I think that's okay. That's sort of a what multi-voting multi does. I mean, there could be issues you, with that. Um, so maybe I'm missing your point. I mean, no, I, I, you're right. Okay. What if what else? You see Go ahead. If you see a lot of votes going one way, uh, you may be inclined to alter what you originally thought and either go with that or you know take a different tack. Yes. So I started with Gina. If Gina had started over here and said, you know, it's all these calendar issues that people have, and we saw that maybe things were building up there, maybe you thought you were going to put stopped on the way but now you're going to put it over on calendar issues because that's winning. So people can play can play winners, right? Yeah. Good. So uh, um, and play favorites. Good. Um, so how might you overcome that one? That issue. It's definitely an issue. How might you overcome it? You can somehow vote anonymously. Exactly. So you can do anonymous voting. Um, like the way I tried to get it into here, I have a lot of trust for you guys, but I said, you know, let's do it first and write it all down first. Now, whether you did that or not, um, hopefully that helped to not change what you had, but that can still happen. So there's definitely, I like the anonymous one uh, better. If you feel that there's a reason to do it, great, you can make that happen. Um, um, so uh, what other issues are there? There's one other. There's one other one. Actually, I think with what Mike said, there's that's part of one of the ones I'm going to mention. <laughs> is an issue with this. Okay, but here's here's one of the first ones. Do we do you think that we all agree on what the word important means with respect to this right here? Probably not. 
So you might want to spend some time talking about what do we mean by important, right? One way to do that is to get people to think about what your key output variable is, right? If your key output variable is turnaround time, then we're going to talk about uh, we're, we're trying to solve the problem of how long this is taking, right? Why is this taking so long? Um, let's, that's what the importance is right here. Okay, so, so try and get people arranged on you know, what important means. Another way that you can do it is to take the direct thing in, say, in saying, well, there's likelihood, there's probability that it happens, and then there's, or how often it happens, and then there's how much damage does it do. So it's the combination of those two. And that's another way that you can maybe handle it. I'm sure there's other ways that you can handle it that you've thought of and will work for you. Okay, let us, um, uh, there's one other thing, and I think this is very much related to what Mike said, and so that's, uh, that's why I wanted to point it out, and that is that this is just what people think. Now, a lot of times it, it nails it, um, and it's a great way to dive down and get, into the bottom, get to the bottom of a problem or to focus efforts really quickly. But it really is just what people think. So if it doesn't, if it ends up not being, uh, not totally solving the problem, um, that can happen, right? So, so just keep that in mind. It's a team tool, very powerful. It's often, you know, for a lot of the times when you're first starting in an area, you can virtually solve the problem right away. I mean, my guess is that, that as we were writing this, let me erase, let me erase all of the blue here. As we were writing down these things, um, most of you had uh, five or six um, different solutions already. I mean, to no consequences. I'm sure we can think of, you know, what are consequences? What would be consequences? How could we shape that? How could we shape the meeting so that we could have consequences drive being late and maybe people would make it up, uh, make up on more time? I'm sure you were thinking of that. And same with the whole too many meetings. Are there solutions for that? You bet. Uh, but the thing is to <clears throat> to kind of take it into a mind or to take it into account that a lot of the problems that you're going to uh, problems project wise that you're going to deal with is you're going into an area where there are many many different things that you could do. Well, let's uh, nail those down into a few things that we're going to look at very deeply and uh, and solve so that we get a, a real bang for the buck. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, well, before I move on, what questions do you have on brainstorming, affinity, multi-voting? Okay. Um, all right. I am going to, in the uh, spirit of keeping on time here, <clears throat> of what we just did, uh, um, I am going to um, say just a couple of things. We finished everything except for YY analysis and the spider graph. Now I'm going to cover those, but we didn't get to hypothesis testing at all. So, and it is covered in the assignment a little bit. Um, not that much, uh, but a little bit. So I want to give you some guidelines of how you can, um, how you can um, deal with that. So the first thing I want to do is let's finish up the, uh, the two things. There's two other tools that you can use to, uh, one is a drill down tool and it's called YY analysis. Let me just show you what it is. Um, generally speaking, the solutions that you get from either a fishbone, I'm sorry, the effects that you, or the causes that you usually get are usually not root causes of the problem. Like for example, let's just go back to, you know what, let's just go back to our, the, the thing here. So we said that, um, we said that for example, uh, too many meetings, uh, is a cause of why we're having too many meetings. What might be a, a, uh, a deeper cause for too many? Why would we have too many meetings? There's not enough um, subject matter experts in whatever the topic is. So you're getting pulled into uh, all of the calls? I'm always the, I'm always the expert, <laughs> is, is kind of what you're saying. Right. I, yeah. I get, and, and maybe it's, uh, why do I have too many meetings? Maybe it's because I'm invited to too many. Right. And why do I get, why do I get invited? Because I'm the only expert or something like that. Right. Um, or uh, there are other branches to this too. Why do I have too many meetings? Because I get invited to too many. Why do I get invited to too many? Because 
I'm always, because we invite way too many people in the first place. It's just our culture to invite everybody. So there's lots of different things that you can do to get the sort of the root cause. One of those tools, um, one of those tools is the why, why analysis. And uh, this is another one that I would say, um, um, use at your own discretion because it can sometimes be very bushy, as we saw with that last one. Um, uh, the example that Michael gave and the example that I gave, those were a little bit different. But the idea is you start with the effect or the symptom, and then you start asking why until you get to endpoints. And usually the endpoint is because Mother Nature is, made it that way, uh, or if you're a religious person because God made it that way, or because that's the way it is. I, I don't know. That's, that's one of the ways. So, for example, let me just give you a, a, what I hope will be a humorous one. Um, we have a poor vacation. Why? Because the kids are unhappy. Now, there could be other whys, but the idea is let's prune the tree and take this down a little bit. Uh, let's take this down a little bit too deeply. Why are they unhappy? Because they're tired, and I could, I could keep going on that if I wanted, or because they're frustrated, uh, or because they're bored. Uh, well, why are they bored? Well, we went to the Museum of Medieval Farming. Uh, okay, uh, how about this one? Why are they frustrated? Uh, because we had bad food or because they have uncool parents. Uh, why do they have uncool parents? Well, there's mom and there's dad. And, you know, you're not going to get any anything uh, beyond that one. You know, dad is just inherently uncool and boring, which is why he forced us to go to the Museum of Medieval Farming. Anyway, the you know, the point is at some point you can usually go up and find some things that are actionable. Um, let me give you a, a different apocryphal example. This is an apocryphal example, no question about it. Um, but um, one of the things was why are the Lincoln Memorial steps wearing out? <clears throat> See how long it takes me to describe this, huh? Why are they wearing out? Okay. So the idea is, gen it's called the five whys or why why because generally you have to ask about five times. So they're wearing out because we're cleaning them too much. Why? Why are we cleaning them too much? Because there's too much pigeon poop on the, on, the Lincoln, on the steps. Why is there too much pigeon poop? Well, because the pigeons are eating spiders on the steps. Uh, why are they eating spiders? Well, because they're there. Why are the spiders there? Because there's all these gnats. Why are the gnats there? They're coming from reflecting pool at dark. Why are they coming from the reflecting pool? Because the lights are on at dusk. Why are the lights on at dusk? Because we put them on. Why do we do that? Because we do. Oh, it looks like we've reached the end. So we put them on. That's a policy. We can change that. We can make that actionable. We can, we can put the lights on a little bit later or a little bit earlier. I guess earlier wouldn't work. Putting them on a little bit later, we might be able to change that policy and save the steps on the Lincoln Memorial. I've heard that somebody actually told me that this is real. That's such bull because I heard it um, about, uh, I, I heard a British guy give an example and he used the statue at, uh, of Lord Nelson at Trafalgar Square and it was the same uh, all the way. So I just don't believe it. <laughs> um, either they have a gnat problem as well or whatever. But think about the power of that, right? You ask why enough till you get to a, a, a root cause that you can do something about that makes sense. If you think about, uh, what if we had stopped right here? We might be shooting pigeons on the Washington Mall. Probably not a good idea um, to do that. Anyway, that's why why analysis. Now the good news is if you if you drill down in some of those areas, like if you pick like two or three, you often find that they have the same root cause. Like in this example for the poor vacation, dad being inher inherently uncool was the the root cause. Maybe you leave dad at home or something like that next time. I don't know. But uh, obviously, I'm making that up. But sometimes uh, what teams will find is they drill down on a number of these different items, and they find the same root cause uh, when they do the YY analysis, which is pretty 
neat. Like on our example here, um, we might drill down into why are there too many meetings and, and uh, uh, we're finishing up, uh, we have too many meetings and we're finishing up another task that we deem more important as being connected to a similar sort of root cause. Well, I have too many meetings, which is why I don't have any time to work, which is why I'm always finishing up things um, in order to go into the next meeting. Or some people say there's no breaks between meetings. So, you know, similar sort of thing. Hopefully that makes sense to folks. Okay. I am going to leave the last one to you to read it, um, uh, but it's a... Uh, 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 interrelationship digraph or a spider diagram. I don't find too many teams using this, but it's a, actually a decent tool for helping a team think laterally about a problem rather than linearly solving it. And and so uh, let me just show the the idea is that um, you take for every one of your affinity categories. So these are I'm going to show it to you. What the heck? These are the affinity categories. And you know, sometimes instead of saying, um, um, uh, like in our affinity categories, I think we came up with personnel, call of nature, uh, logistics, stuff like that. And for each one of these pairs, you ask, does one thing drive the other? So for example, does cost drive transportation issues? Um, and then you ask the other question as well. And generally speaking, you can see this helps you find sort of what are the root causes. Um, so, for example, in this one, um, our affinity diagram. I'm just let me see if I can go back to that, just to show with this example right here, the affinity diagram organized it into well, the problem is either cost, kids activities, food issues, miscellaneous, which doesn't help, lack of interest or transportation. So that when we're here. That's what these categories are right here, transportation, cost, friends, interest, kids' activities. And you can see the kids' activities drive transportation issues, but transportation issues don't drive kids' activities. And so you can count the number of out arrows and the number of in arrows, and it's the out arrows that are the key drivers. Um, so it's a nice little tool that you can use. Uh, I find very few teams use this, um, but it can be helpful. Uh, I think the problem is it gets to be a complicated uh, diagram pretty quickly. Um, so, all right, um, so we've covered all the section in the team tools, and like I said, uh, it's, it's very important, uh, the stuff in there in terms of how, what you can use. The, hopefully, I think you'd agree that all of these are tools that you could use, um, that you could use um, in, your, in your work or certainly in your project, very team-oriented tools. Um, all right. So I wanted to do two things. One is to, uh, before, we, before we finish up here, one is to remind you that we do not have class next Tuesday. Um, and I will send out um, probably Monday uh, some other request times for when we can. I'll do it today if I have some time, but I'm guessing I won't or on the weekend have any time uh, to do this. Um, but uh, I'll send out some requests for, you know, what are some times. And if maybe if we can just extend it, that would maybe be the easiest way to do it. So uh, if that works for everybody or for most people. Um, that's number one. The second thing is um, for the assignment, we obviously didn't cover hypothesis testing, which we have to cover. Um, uh, and that's on this section right here. So starting on 109, um, um, we want to look through that. There is a video um, that's posted on this, so you can look it through. Um, but for any questions that relate to this in the assignment, um, I'll have to. Uh, uh, I I have to see whether it, you know. I have to check back to see whether. Uh, we can just either skip those in the assignment or whether I want to just give a, well, I'll tell you what, why don't, um, why don't we do this? Um, we do have the videos on both this and on the ANOVA, uh, which is this section uh, right here um, on 143. But the section on 109 uh, is 
quite important, and I want to make sure we cover that. Um, um, it's simplified greatly by using Excel stats, but I want to do a couple of examples with you first together. So feel free to go ahead on that. But what I'm going to do is um, instead of having the assignment, the assignment was supposed to be due next Friday. It's due the Friday. We'll, we'll, we'll just delay that to the Tuesday after that. Okay, so we'll give you an additional weekend so I can spend a little bit of time next Friday talking about hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. But it would really be helpful, I think, for you to uh, watch that video in the meantime uh, on hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Um, that should help you walk through some examples, and then we'll do them live in class next time. Um, and that's it. So I'll, I'll make sure I send a, an email to all of you just reminding that it's going to be, uh, that I'm uh, extending the, uh, the time on that assi on assignment number two. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Um, covered a lot, and yet there's so much more to cover. Um, that's, that's the way it's going, I guess. We'll, we'll be making it up, I think, pretty quickly. Um, but uh, have a great weekend. Bundle up. I, I think it's actually going to hit 40 on Sunday and then promptly go back down uh, here. Um, uh, in Florida, I hope it's a little bit warmer than that. Uh, but have a great, what's that? We had a record cold today. We hit 39 last night. 39 below? No, above, but everybody is in snowmobile suits pretty much. It's pretty funny. Oh, okay. Oh, that was Tammy. I thought that was Gina. No, oh, yeah. Okay. 39. Yeah, no, Chicago was ridiculously cold last uh, yesterday. I was talking with somebody there. So, yeah. yeah. Between 20 and 30 below. Yeah, we're getting your weather today. We're not quite that low. We're like minus 10 right now, but uh, it's the coldest day of the year for sure. All right, we'll bundle up and uh, weather the weekend. Have a great one. And I'll stay on the line a little bit to uh, answer any questions that you have. But uh, we'll see you next Friday. Uh, but don't be shy in reaching out in the meantime, okay? So hey, thanks for your time, guys. Hey, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yes. Hey, Mark, are you sending out the uh, next binder? Oh, yes, the next binder is sent out. Shoot, I forgot to say that. So I'll send an email as well. It's already been sent out. Um, it okay. will get there, um, I think it's guaranteed to get there, uh, you're in New Hampshire, it's guaranteed to be there 4.30, and it, there, nobody's going to sign for it, so uh, there's no signature required. So I don't know whether you have it going okay. to be a residence or not, but it should be there yeah. by 4.30 on okay. Monday. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mark. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, John. Okay, bye. Bye.